And so good morning and welcome to today's PassFax webinar. My name is Cindy Webster and I am hosting Behind the Scenes today. This webinar has been funded by the Department of Primary Industries and GRDC as part of the RPM for Greens project. And our presenter today is Dr. Dustin, aka Dusty Sivertson. And Dusty is a experienced field and research entomologist based at the Northern Deep Herd office. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I think this will probably be a refresher for a lot of people um, that have a bit of experience in this area. Um, but hopefully there are some people that don't have much experience at all and can get an idea of, uh, yeah, what to look for in uh, canola crops, what we need to be worried about, but also what the natural enemies are and uh, how we can sort of um, protect the crop. So what I'll be talking about is a little bit of background and context to do with pests and natural enemies in canola, particularly to do with the grain belt of WA. So I'll go through the main pests and how we sort of get to a stage where um, we, when we're walking into a crop, how we can detect the pest or natural enemy and get to a stage where we can identify it and make some decisions from there. So just going way back a bit in terms of what is an insect to start off with? Well, the adults, we're looking at three body segments, three pairs of legs, antennae and winged some of the time. And I guess where there's some confusion is that the juvenile forms can look very different than the adults. So when we're talking about insects, which really form the bulk of our um, pests, not all invertebrates are insects just a certain way of, that we classify them to be able to identify them properly. And it's, it's worth mentioning, I think, as to how things work in pretty much across agricultural industries uh, across the world, really, um, in terms of the industry itself and what sort of support there is for growers uh, and agronomists. Generally, we work in this sort of format here where we're looking at um, field entomologists, often state-based, uh, supporting growers and agronomists with particular issues. Uh, in the past, there used to be a lot of state agronomists, and that's sort of become more privatized. Um, but in, in terms of where, we, where we're at in supporting growers and agronomists, we don't uh, have the expertise to identify everything. There are literally thousands and thousands of species out there of invertebrates. Often we come across them, and we have no idea what they are, and we really have to lie with taxonomists. And in some cases, the taxonomists that we have, here's a couple of examples of our taxonomists in South Perth, Cameron Brumley and, and Mark Widmer, have really dedicated a lot of their careers to be being able to identify some really, really difficult um, species. And in some cases, they actually have to send specimens off to international museums to people that can then identify um, things that are very difficult. But generally the, the idea that we're, that we're working with is, is you're more than likely going to come across things that are common um, and that are main pests. Uh, and so I think in terms of things that you're not very confident about, get, certainly get in touch with us and send us samples and, um, and reports. And resources are things that we always carry with us. Um, I, I think generally, we probably go to websites more often than not these days. And uh, our DeepRed website has a lot of support um, information, which is still for, for DeepRed, it's for us in the agriculture area. It's still agric.wa.gov.au. Um, IPM guidelines for grains.com.au is a real collaborative, um, I guess, arrangement amongst a whole bunch of institutions in, in WA, um, which is hosted by uh, Queensland government, and it focuses on pests and, uh, of, of, of broad acre cropping. And of course, GRDC have a lot of resources online, but also in print. So I'll be referring a lot to this, this manual in the top right called the iSpy manual, which we tend to use in our insect training courses. It goes into a bit more depth in terms of identifying certain things and looking at what you might confuse um, some invertebrates with. Uh, whereas the, the Ute Guide is, is sort of the tried and tested um, 
that we often carry with us that has all the common um, ben, um, pests and, and natural enemies in there and a bit of information on them. So there's a lot of guides and also um, the Diamondback Moth Best Management Guide, not only for identifying and managing, but also looking at things like insecticide resistance, which we've, we have to manage with some of our pests. And so looking at pests in general for canola, at the moment, as we head towards July, or head towards August pretty quickly here, uh, we shift away from the first half of the growing season, which where we're, we're really worried about protecting the emerging seedlings and the biomass production. And we're heading towards that change in phenology where their uh, plants are shifting resources to to their reproductive stage into, into, into budding, flowering, potting, and grain fill. And very typically with a lot of crops, we see this shift in, in species. And so we're really looking at, to a lesser extent, rather glen bug, which is on here. I think that's more of a problem over east, not so much for us in spring. And Hilicoverpa armidra, we know it's, it's in WA and we have trapped for it, for using pheromone moth traps in the past to see see if it is. We know it, it, it's sort of trickling around, but we haven't really seen the caterpillars um, cause any damage at all. Um, but we'll look at the diagnostic features of the caterpillars. But certainly Helicoverpa punctigera, the native budworm, is a, is a major pest that we worry about in canola. Um, certainly the diamondback moth, and then we'll also look at the aphid pests that we need to worry about. And you'll see I threw in the, the methods that we, that we use to, to monitor these in the field. Uh, diamondback moth and, and native budworm tend to dislodge pretty easily from plants. And I guess the sweep net technique has been tried and tested um, as a monitoring technique and they, they fall in pretty well. Whereas aphids, because their mouth parts are usually embedded in the plant, they don't usually um, dislodge all that easily. And I have heard, heard of a lot of people using sweep netting to monitor for aphids and crops. Um, I mean, it can be good to see whether they're there if you can if you can get them in your sweep net, and often you do see them in your sweep net contents. Um, but they don't really dislodge all that easily, so it's not the best method. Visual inspection is kind of where we're at. That's where the thresholds uh, have been based on as well. So we'll have a look at that. But even before we get to the pest itself, we look for other clues in the crop, which often guide us to to the pest. Feeding damage is the biggest one by far, where we have um, leaf chewing, where the caterpillars are small. In the case of diamondback moth, with such tiny mouth parts, we often see some windowing in the leaves, which is not always, always evident from the surface. You might have to turn leaves over if the larvae are quite small, if you want to see whether DBM larvae are present in sort of a vegetative stage, very early, early flowering you might be able to see that that windowing. Um, and then we have stunted and stunted growth. Um, it would be something that would you would want to hone in on in the crop and certainly areas where you can see where flowers are are aborting. Maybe the crop, maybe the plants are stunted and they haven't really pushed through to flower yet. But flower abortion uh, is something that uh, is, is pretty typical of things like aphids. And certainly the visual appearance of the pest, but whether we can whether we can identify it at arm's length, such as this caterpillar here, I can see with its features is the pasture day moth caterpillar, whereas others I might want to get in closer with a hand lens. Um, and I mentioned the the sampling methods are are quite important for you to be able to to get to the pest. And the a knowledge of the feeding habits is important. So diamondback moth only feeds on brassicas, so you're not going to find it in other nearby crops. And likewise, you're not going to find the cereal aphid species, for example, in, in canola. So it's good to know what pests you're likely to, to see in the crop. And the behavior of the pest really works to our advantage with, with things like diamondback moth. It wriggles rapidly. The, the larvae wriggle rapidly. Um, they do drop on a, on a, on a silken web when you disturb the plants or if you're bashing them, you'll often see them hanging from a web. But really the best way to identify diamondback moth larvae is to give them a bit of a nudge after you've sweep netted them and see if they wriggle rapidly. It's a really, really handy tool I'll talk about in a minute. 
It's good to know the life cycle. So aphids, for example, in Australia don't reproduce sexually. They bypass that altogether and produce live young, and those live young are already producing live young as they're being as they're being born. So you can see that exponential potential um, and how they can explode when conditions are just right for them. And a knowledge of the history of these pests for us is, is really good to know. So we expect native budworm migrations every year. And this year it's been really, really early, probably even before July. So it's um, the earliest I can remember where we're finding these. Um, and and we, we, we monitor these using pheromone moth traps and then use that as an indication um, of whether, whether we need to get out there and monitor for the caterpillars. Fall armyworm, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's a new pest to Australia. Canola is on the host list for that. So, but in terms of history, there is no history for it yet for us um, in the grain belt of WA. And um, to our knowledge, hasn't even been detected uh, in the grain belt yet. So if we start off with a really big group of caterpillars called the, the noctuids. The, these form a lot of the pests that we have in broad acre cropping. Uh, and they include the cutworms, native budworm, um, and the armyworms as well, including the fall armyworm. But you can see with the structure here, what we're looking at is a typical head with chewing mouth parts, three pairs of legs at the front, four pairs in the middle, and one pair at the back. So if you're finding caterpillars that are, for example, missing legs in the middle, you might be looking at uh, a group of looper caterpillars, or something quite different. So there's all these all these things that we look, and this is native budworm here, you can see the legs here and how it's much harder to diagnose once it once it gets some um, smaller and after it's some um, emerged from eggs. Um, so the armyworm species we do have, apart from fall armyworm, obviously they're a pest of cereals and not a pest of canola, but they are, um, they're all in this group. Um, so starting with native budworm as, as really a major pest of canola, certainly of pulse crops, but um, often we have to con control this in, in, in canola. And the pictures obviously of uh, on lupins, but it's a good, it's a picture showing a good side view and a top view. You can see it's sort of bumpy. Um, this is a full grown caterpillar. So you can see the, the markings on it and the, the legs without having to go into too much detail. And knowing that it shouldn't be um, shouldn't be confused with uh, diamondback moth, obviously, but where these caterpillars are very small, they can be confused with diamondback moth. I mentioned that it is a migratory species. It's interesting that it's native. Uh, generally feeds on the Asteraceae or daisy uh, family of plants, and uh, since we've been uh, cleared the land and, and cropped monocultures, they found found them quite tasty and a lot of other species of very closely related moths don't really want to um, have a bar of it. So it's uh, it's become a pest for us in, in, in that way. And I mentioned that it, it causes feeding damage. It gets its name from chewing on buds of many other types of crops, but it certainly will um, feed on uh, leaves early um, as we've seen this in this season. Um, often not eventuating into uh, any economic loss, but we're, we're, we're looking at situ where, where they're coming in early. We are looking at situations where they're completely defoliating plants, and then any buds that are coming out or flowers, they're, they're getting rid of those. So it is a numbers game. It's important to know numbers um, as well, which is what we use to calculate spray thresholds. But in some years, there are enormous numbers, and so you're looking at a pretty high rate of of feeding damage in, in those those scenarios. And probably the best way to distinguish really small native budworm in your sweep net contents, I mentioned that diamondback moth wriggle rapidly and, and native budworm do not. So it's really worth, if you're sweep netting or knocking plants into a container, get rid of that larger debris that you might have in there and just let it settle for 10 to 15 seconds because um, the caterpillars are kind of in a state of shock for a little while. You'll see pretty quickly um, if you nudge the caterpillars after they've settled, the diamondback moth caterpillars will wriggle rapidly. 
And so if, if you have huge numbers of budworm and diamondback moth together in one sample, you're probably going to find it a little difficult, but that's the best way to distinguish um, with small budworm. And, and larger budworm, you're going to know straight away, um, unless it's fall armyworm, which we'll, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, and it's really that, that spring generation that's of importance. It's similar to diamondback moth where insects in, in, in warm temperatures reproduce faster and so, um, and they grow faster and therefore do much more damage as we head, as we head into spring and to a lesser extent these colder days um, in winter. So if we look at the caterpillars of native budworm, a good way if we think that they're maybe going to be mis misdiagnosed. I mentioned um, Helicoverpa armigera, which we know is trickling around. It's also called the corn earworm. The hairs on the, the head region of native budworm are black, whereas on Helicoverpa armigera, we have white hairs around the head region. A saddle, a bit lower here, but not always so defined when the caterpillars are young. Um, and then we have another species, lesser budworm, which is worth mentioning. It's, it's not a pest of canola, but we have at times seen, um, because it feeds on cereals and grasses, or prefers cereals and grasses, uh, where there are grasses in the canola crop, people are picking these up and thinking that they're maybe causing damage to the crop itself, but they're actually associated with the weeds. So this one um, right away is, if, you, if there are white hairs along the body, um, that's a very good indication that it's lesser budworm. And in terms of the moths, they're a very sort of dull color altogether in this huge group of moths. And so I try to avoid that um, where we have to, maybe we send samples off to taxonomists, but um, we can get around that using pheromone traps, species specific pheromone traps, that's what we do. But where we see moths sort of out and about, it really could be one of um, hundreds of, of, of species. And the diamondback moth is the other major, I guess, group of caterpillars that we need to be worried about. It gets its name from the diamond pattern on the moth. It's smaller than native budworm moths and a bit skinnier, but you can often see them darting around um, as you walk through the canola crop. You can see the size of them with this photo here relative to the, the person's hand. These are full grown caterpillars, so they don't grow nearly as big as native budworm. And from there, they'll actually pupate on the plant and, and emerge as a moth. So um, the fact that they're small can work to our advantage as well. You can see that they're usually cigar shaped. That's another good indication, but not so much with the tiny larvae. So again, it's probably better to use that that wriggling um, technique to see, uh, but where, where they're fuller grown caterpillars, it's really easy to, to distinguish and um, amongst native budworm as well. Very high numbers are required for economic damage being a small caterpillar, but we have this scenario where as we're heading into spring, it's just the, root, the, the best conditions for this particular pest. And so the, um, the exponential potential is really quite high in terms of getting those numbers up quickly. And that's where we see outbreaks um, occur. But also this pest is really on the top of our list because it's resistant to most groups that we, um, that we have available to us. We have one product registered for it at the moment, and um, which is never a good thing to have just one product or one, one active. And so um, I guess if it was very easily controlled, which native budworm is, um, maybe it would be lesser of a concern, but um, it also, because it has so many overlapping generations, you'll see, you'll see eggs, moths, and all stages of caterpillars together um, in the crop. That means that one spray often, you're not killing the eggs. Um, so then you have this secondary generation come through after the spray. So, um, it's kind of a different different thing altogether. But when we do get out and um, get into sweep netting once it's started flowering and onwards, um, we can certainly look at look at the caterpillars there. But the damage 
even when it's sort of early flowering, we want to look at some of the damage, and this is quite typical. We can see windowing and leaf damage, and there's a bit of uh, webbing through here. That's a good indication, and all of this black material here is the frass or um, caterpillar poo amongst that. So it's a good indication you have caterpillars, and hone in on that and, and see what's going on. And I mentioned pupae as well, so you'll see these pupae here that are stuck to the plants, maybe on the underside of leaves. So it's worth having a look at that as well and seeing not just what are the caterpillar numbers, but if you're seeing a lot of pupae, you, you, you know that you're gonna have a whole bunch of moths emerge soon. And finally, the, the fall armyworm. It, I mentioned it's a new pest to Australia, pretty much from January this year. The situation was, it was detected in uh, the west part of Africa in 2016, uh, but not able to be eradicated. And just in that period of, of uh, four odd years, it, it, it migrated through to Asia, Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, and then um, in January through to Northern Queensland. Not long after that was detected in Darwin, Kununurra, and then I think April was um, detected in um, Carnarvon. We don't know, we haven't detected it yet any further south than that. And here at Deepherd, we have quite a lot of follow me worm traps that are grower operated, grower group operated, and Deepherd. Um, so we, have a, we do have a good network of pheromone traps out and we're getting zeros. Uh, so we don't know whether it's here or not. But as I mentioned, canola is on the host list. So we want to stay on top of this, not to mention cereals and pulses as well. Um, Setlana will be talking about pulses next week, but it's something that's on our radar. We want to stay on top of it because where it does occur, it's, it's causing quite a lot of damage. Where it does occur in the Americas and they grow canola, it is damaging canola. So we want to be on top of it and we want to be able to identify it. So apart from pheromone trapping, the caterpillars really are the best way of diagnosing and typical of armyworms if you're familiar with armyworms in cereals they usually have this more pronounced collar behind the head and this one does fortunately so if you do see this collar behind the head and it's canola it's more than likely fall armyworm because the others feed on cereals but all of these other diagnostic features are good to know as well this Y pattern on the head and the um, the arrangement of, of black dots on the back and the stripes. Although we were getting we were getting confusion this year with quite a high number of cabbage center grub uh, caterpillars, which can look similar. So if you if you do think you might have fall armyworm, get in touch with us, and we'll um, we're very happy to take photos and samples, and we really want to get get an idea of of when and where this this thing is is moving throughout the grain belt. And so moving into aphids, the three species we worry about in canola are cabbage and turnip aphids and sometimes green peach aphids. So if we start with green peach aphids, it's really one more associated with the, the first half of the year, I guess because it, it is actually more so affiliated with um, virus transmission, turnip yellows virus. And it also prefers leaves. So unless plants are stressed, you find that uh, they'll be on the leaves even through through into spring and leaves can drop and then green peach aphids will disappear. But where plants are stressed, we've seen them um, persist. But in terms of identification, you can see they're a bulbous shaped aphid. Um, they're kind of a, a yellow to, to light green. And you'll see that the winged forms look very different between species. So we often avoid this as well where we have to um, in terms of identifying large numbers of these. It's really the wingless forms that we want to look at. So we look at, in terms of green peach aphids, not just the shape and the color, but also the uh, what are called tubercles, the bits at the right at the front of the head where the antenna meet. If they're turned inwards, which you'll need a hand lens for, very quick and easy way of seeing whether they're green peach aphids as opposed to what you're probably more likely to confuse them with would be uh, turnip aphids, which we'll talk about in a sec. But also the siphuncles at the back, which we call exhaust pipes. Um, so they're much longer in green peach aphids than cabbage and, and turnip aphids. So those are really good diagnostic features 
to look out for. So here's a picture of green peach aphids. They're not so much plump. Sometimes they're, yeah, a bit sort of flattened like this for various reasons. The coloring is not consistently green, but um, you can see the, the exhaust pipes out the back are a bit longer, and I would just get a, get a hand lens in quick um, and just see if those tubercles are turned inwards, just, just to make sure that these are green peach aphids. Um, you'll notice here we have uh, a shell of an aphid, which is uh, a mummified aphid. And I'll just switch to this picture here, which is another picture of green peach aphids. You can see they're more bulbous, a um, bit more fluid in their bodies, and a lot more of these mummified aphids. So these are an indication that they've been parasitized with a tiny wasp that is about the size of the aphids. So they're very tiny and easily uh, overlooked in the field. But it's worth noting as well, especially in spring, if the canopy stays a bit moist, not only can we get complete wipeout by a fungus, we'll come in and wipe them out, um, an antimepathogenic fungus, which looks like it might be starting here on some of these. But also the color change in some of these green peach aphids is typical of green peach aphids. There's a number of reasons for that. There's temperatures, uh, bacterial associations, and, and whatnot, but, and they could be parasitized as well. But it's another indication that they're green peach aphids and the fact that they're clustered on leaves as well. Um, and as I mentioned, if, if we have moisture stressed crops and they persist through we don't know a lot about their effects on, on pods, um, whether they cause shriveled seed, but I think it's something we do need to look into. Um, and so moving on to the turnip aphid, the one we're more likely to confuse with the green peach aphid. Uh, we have a, yeah, a situation again where the, wing, the winged forms are very similar. You can look for these dark bars, but really on the wingless forms, we often see, even though they're quite a green aphid, these dark bars on the abdomen. It's a good one to look out for. And the tips of these siphuncles or exhaust pipes, um, that's generally the, the usual length of them. Um, and so um, as opposed to green peach aphids, which do prefer leaves, turnip aphids uh, prefer um, the flowering spikes or the racemes. So that's another good indication. And the last and arguably most damaging um, species of aphid in canola also prefers racemes. So um, generally, we, through research, we know we don't really need to look at the leaves all that much. And where they do the most damage is, is um, from the racemes. And you'll see that the exhaust pipes here are quite reduced, but the, the best way of, of identifying cabbage aphids in canola is the fact that they produce this gray waxy scale. Um, the younger, eight, you might see a cluster where some of them don't have that, and it's usually because they just haven't produced it yet. You can get a mix of cabbage and turnip aphids together, which really at the end of the day um, doesn't matter that much in terms of management because they do respond um, the same to the same insecticides. But in terms of identification, it's really that waxy scale that's um, a giveaway for there. So here's a cluster of um, cabbage aphids. And so this is quite late in a potting canola crop, but we can see a number of things happening here. We have parasitized aphids here. So there's a chance that that gets taken over, but really at this stage, what I'd be, what's happened here, this was a, a trial where we just sort of let it, let it go. A lot of these pods down here didn't have much, much of an effect, but we had Flower abortion, you can see here. We have pod abortion here. That's really the effect that they have in reducing yield. And then in terms of reducing quality, where we have a lot of these cabbage or turnip aphids on pods, and they're sucking that assimilate from the plant that, that's trying to fill the grain, you end up with very shriveled grain that um, isn't even collected by the header. So that's that's the effect that it has, but you can see, Fortunately, because it's on the top of the plant in spring, even just with a ute driving, you can often see, um, but it is worth getting out and having a look. So we've talked about the main pests. Um, generally, we think, we think of um, what we find in terms of invertebrates in the crop 
as pat pests, natural enemies, or innocent bystanders. I won't talk about the innocent bystanders, but there are a lot out there, and we don't really want to worry about them to the extent of uh, getting them getting confused with other things. But certainly, natural enemies is an important. Um, it's important to be able to identify what you find out there, and um, not just because they're out there feeding on the pests, but we are finding more and more that they're being confused with pests, and so crops are being sprayed uh, for for natural enemies. So we'll talk about some of the main ones and how there's been some confusion. I mentioned uh, mummified aphids. You can see this shell shell here that we saw. The picture is a good illustration here of, it looks like this tiny wasp is stinging the aphid when in fact it's depositing an egg into the aphid which hat hatches into a small larva which grows and then uses the aphid body as its own cocoon, cuts a little hole out the back and then emerges as a wasp. And in some cases, there's enough to really get on top of um, aphid populations. And it's also worth mentioning because with, with these particular natural enemies, there's opportunities for us to use selective options like perimicarb, where um, the broad spectrums like uh, the synthetic pyrethroids and organophosphates will kill all of these wasps that are that are out there working to, uh, to our advantage, whereas perimicarb will be specific and, and help clean up any sort of secondary um, outbreaks. But in terms of sweep netting, we won't usually pick up the mummies and sweep nets, but we will pick up a lot of other natural enemies. So what, what do we come across and uh, what should we, I guess, um, want to identify? The ladybird beetles are the, probably the most common, maybe to a lesser extent the larvae because they um, are a little bit more cryptic, crawl around the plant, but you will pick them up in sweep nets. And the, the larvae and the adults are pretty ferocious in, in the number of aphids they can eat. Um, and it's kind of early days in the grains industry, but we really want to get on top of what are the scenarios where they can work, really work to our, to our advantage. Lacewing larvae are another big group. Um, and you can see they have three, three pairs of legs, look a little bit like a, a crocodile here, but they have chewing mouth parts and they're out feeding on the aphids as well. In terms of sweep net uh, contents, I mentioned letting it settle to see whether larvae are wriggling in that. When you let the sweep net content settle, a lot of times you'll see these, what just looks like a clump of fluff crawling around. And that's often um, lacewing larvae where they've they've placed on their backs bits of debris and dead bodies from victims that they've sucked dry. They'll put them on their back as a form of camouflage. But in terms of uh, sweep net contents, it just looks like a bit of fluff. And here's the adult versions, the common ones, the brown and green lace wings, and the adults as well uh, feed on um, aphids and other really small, soft-bodied insects. Hoverflies are a good one. You can see the adults look more like, like a tiny wasp, and you see them hovering and darting around canola crops. But the larvae um, are sometimes confused with diamondback moth, and we, we hear they're sometimes sprayed, thinking that they're diamondback moth. Being a fly larva, they don't have a true head, but the way to identify them that's probably the best is look for this white stripe. Really gotta get your, your eye in, because it's not always that defined. Um, but again, looking at seeing if that caterpillar wriggles, because hoverfly larvae won't wriggle. They sort of move. They move like a maggot, um, which they are essentially. And if you see these pupae on plants as well, it's a good indication you have um, hoverflies in your crop uh, looking for aphids. And we see a lot of bugs as well when we're sweep netting. Sometimes they're shield bugs and they can be predatory as well, but this group of bugs, which are a bit longer, uh, call, called the damsel bugs, and they have their mouth parts tucked in under their bodies and they're they're darting around the crop looking for um, soft-bodied insects and but especially moth eggs uh, just because we have moths colonizing crops it often doesn't eventuate into many caterpillars being detected 
And uh, we think this is one of the reasons why, especially when we pick these up in the sweep net. And there's another group that's a bit bigger called the assassin bugs. And they do a similar thing where they literally just um, search for and probe uh, moth eggs and, and, and cat especially caterpillars and um, suck the guts out. So that they're, they're out working for us as well. And um, I'll just finish with um, a bit of a plug for uh, PestFax and what we do here at the department. It's not just PestFax and the newsletter that we produce during the season, and Cindy is the, uh, the PestFax editor. But we do produce uh, insecticide charts, which include everything registered according to the APVMA. Um, and we try and capture as much field intelligence as we can because every year is really so different um it's not a case where we can we can generally expect everything to happen the same every year so we want to keep keep ahead of the game for migratory pests such as native budworm we've had a pretty good green bridge this year so we're we're trying to stay on top of diamondback moth um not just through um surveillance but also through a grdc project trying to see um how can we how can we better forecast this this issue which um, potentially is a major problem for canola growers and also obviously things with aphids where where there are out, outbreaks of particular pests which often does happen regionally um, at least at first we want to make sure that people in that region know about it and at least get out in their paddock um, to have a look before the, a significant amount of damage can happen in a relatively short um, period of time and um, so I will just hand back to Cindy. Thanks very much for that Dusty and so as we've mentioned um, we are here to help identify um, insects if you continue to have trouble doing so and there are a variety of ways that the PestFax team can identify what insects you're finding in the crops and one of them is you can download our free PestFax reporter app and just attach an, attach an image a good clear close-up um, photo of the insect um, using your zoom in on your iPhone or Android or a clip on macro lens. This so that we get good um, clear photos of any characteristics that might help identify the insect, as well as the plant damage just to provide clues in case you can't find an insect but you can see the damage. Um, photos of the damage in the plant is also very helpful. And just attach the image to the report and just request an ID that will be one way. Um, you can also email photos to the PestFax email address on the screen or you can mail um, live specimens to Dusty uh, and Svetlana, our entomologist, at the mail the addresses on the screen. And that brings us to our the end of our webinar today. And I'm just going to see uh, we don't have any open questions or chats that we need to follow up. And um, so thank you all very much for attending today. And thank you very much, Dusty, for presenting. And so until we see you again, I'll say goodbye for now and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.